Last weekend, the perfect storm rocked box offices, earning close to $63 million. Based on Sebastian Younger's 1997 best-selling book, the film chronicles the tragic story of a commercial fishing boat called the Andrea Gale. In October of 1991, it departed for a routine swordfish run off the coast of Gloucester, Massachusetts, only to get caught in one of the worst storms in history. All six crew members on board died. Joining me tonight, the author of the book, Sebastian Younger, and one of the stars from the film, Diane Lane. At the age of 14, she landed on the cover of Time Magazine as one of Hollywood's whiz kids and has since appeared in such films as The Outsiders and A Walk on the Moon. In The Perfect Storm, she betrays Chris Cutter, the girlfriend of one of the fishermen who died on the Andrea Gale. I am very pleased on this Friday, one week after the film opened, to have both of them here. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Great to have you back. Thank you. Um, what do you think of the movie? I like it. I like it. The, um, the storm sequences are outrageous. They're really... Outrageous mean over the top how good it is? Yeah, it's very, yeah, it's just very, um, it's hard to believe it's Hollywood, you know, it, it's, um, there are, it's all, it, it looks almost like real footage, at, at times it does, um, and, uh, and you really, my impression of trying to watch it just as a viewer, not as the author of the book, um, was that you really sort of struggle with these guys while they're trying to keep the boat afloat, it's sort of an exhausting movie to watch in a way, because you really, uh, you know, I hate to re resort to a cliche, but it really feels like you're there, you know, yeah. um, and, and they, they really portrayed the town very well. That was my biggest concern, was that, that they wouldn't be respectful of Gloucester. I mean, it's a, it's a town that's had a lot of hard times. And I wanted to make sure that they were, uh, I was concerned that they'd be respectful of the town. Uh, and they were, which, really, you know, that was the, sort of the biggest thing I was looking for when I watched it. What's interesting about that, you two know each other. Yes, we right? You met, met at the time of the filming. Yeah. You went up and watched them film, even though you were the first to say, I had nothing to do with the filming of this, of yeah. this movie. Wolfgang, yeah. I said to you earlier, Who's the happiest and who should be the happiest over the fact that this is a runaway big movie, the big hit of the summer? You said Wolfgang. Wolfgang Peterson. Because he is the one who directed it, obviously, but he's the one who what? What well, else would you say? I think if genius is, a measure, is measured by capacity for detail, this film certainly demanded that of him. I mean, he delivered the goods watching and you have to be meticulous. You're forced into it by the special effects, certainly. But it's like a military operation to have a, a huge budget like this, and a lot of things can get away from you. And he was the right man for the job. And, you know, it, it's sort of like our analogy has been General Patton in the war because go, team, go. He's very yeah. team spirit. He's very much like a coach in that way. This came out beyond expectations of almost everybody, huh? Well, or not? I, I, I'm never, ever there to. Uh, wait for the numbers and do that mentality. Uh, but this is a film that did have a lot of expectation placed upon it. I mean, yeah. it was the GNP of a small nation, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, the yeah. budget. Yeah. The GNP of a place like you just wrote a piece in Vanity Fair about Sierra Leone. Yeah. It's the GNP of Sierra Leone. Probably. Yeah. Probably. It'll be interesting to compare it, but it's probably just about. I'll talk about that in a moment. But but let me go back to. So you write this book. You live in Greenwich Village. Uh, uh, you, East Village. East Village. I'm sorry. All right, East Village. Um, what what brought you to the story? I was living in Gloucester actually when the storm hit. Yeah. Um, I was a um, just about unemployed writer. I was working as a climber for tree companies, and um, I hurt myself pretty badly. I'd hit my leg with a chainsaw, and and that could hurt. Ow! Yeah. Well, it's interesting. It, 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 Oops! It, Oops! <laughs> it didn't hurt. Something. What was upsetting about it was it didn't hurt. I, I actually, I mean, until later, but when I hit my leg, it just felt like I'd been slapped by a tree branch. And I looked down, and it was all, all torn up. Mm -hmm. um, More blood than you've ever seen. Yeah, and I, it really dug deep into my leg. I could see. You it walked fine. Yeah, I recovered. That's it recovered, great. But I almost severed the Achilles. I could see my Achilles tendon. And yeah. uh, it's funny when you're hurt badly, you get into a very dispassionate, sort of um, detached state of mind. And the crew I had working for me, I rappelled down to the bottom of the tree. They took me to the hospital and the crew were just completely freaked out by, by my leg. But, mm -hmm. um, but I, no, I was, I, was, I, was, I was all right about it. But it, it got me thinking that maybe I should write a book on dangerous jobs. You know, I was trying to salvage a writing a journalism career and I, it just it wasn't going anywhere. I couldn't make a living at it. So I was going to write a book on dangerous jobs. That would get me out of the one I was in and it would sort of launch me, I was hoping. And about two months after I hurt myself, this huge storm hit Gloucester. 
And um, I was living up there with my girlfriend at the time um, in a little house overlooking the harbor. And they just, the, the, the wind, the, the sea rose up and it was covering the road to our house. And, and um, it was incredible wind outside, just sort of moaning through the telephone lines. We went out and watched these huge 35 foot swells, waves, just exploding against these mansions in the back shore because the, the rich people all live in the back shore where it's most scenic, you know, and their houses were just getting destroyed. And the next day, I found out that a Gloucester boat, the Andrea Gale, had been lost off Nova Scotia. And I thought, well, if I ever do this book on dangerous jobs, maybe I'll have the Andrea Gale be the focus of the chapter on commercial fishing. Mm. And um, I later found out that there had been incredible rescues during this storm and really record-setting waves. The waves were over 100 feet offshore. So between having seen it, the boat was from Gloucester, you know, and, and these huge waves and these rescues, I thought, well, you know, what, what more do you need it? In a, uh, Lots in a, of fodder. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I have my story. Like, yeah, like that's yep. there's a storm. To write yeah, but about. but but then you're writing about a boat in which you recreate things in a sense. You're writing about a boat in which everybody died. Yeah, and that was journal and, go ahead. journalistically that was really tough, um, as you can imagine, because I didn't want to fictionalize it. You know, if I had ever worked as a fisherman and knew that really knew that world, I would have considered it. Or if I was a better writer better fiction writer I would have considered it but I'm a journalist and I thought no I've got to stick with got to stick with that you know and and um, the points in the story the closer that they get to the moment where they sank the less information I had right. and so the last few hours last couple of days it's almost no information there's a few radio contacts so what I did was I sort of transposed other people's experiences I would say to the reader look there's no way to know what happened on the Andrea Gale but here's another boat that sank in 1982 in a similar storm, um, but one guy survived. And you know, if we ask him what was going through his mind when he was trapped in a flooded wheelhouse as the boat was sinking, we have, we'll have a, probably have a pretty good idea what was going on through the minds of the men of the Andrea Gale. And so I, I sort of put this, the, the parts of the, the blank spots of the map that I could never know, I put them together by a sort of analogy. Um, and uh, and seem, people seem to like that approach. This guy was um, 100 mile, 200 miles offshore, in 70 foot waves and the, and the wave flipped his boat over and it started to sink immediately and the wheelhouse flooded and he was trapped in the dark with a lung full of air in a flooded wheelhouse in 70 foot seas 200 miles offshore I mean you're basically, He's got no you're basically dead yeah right, right. You know? this is over and he knew that and he, he, what he wanted to do was exhale and get it over with and he said he felt no fear at all that he actually thought you know it's gonna be much easier to just die right now and if I struggle and thrash around and try and save myself, it's just going to prolong this. And I don't want to. I, don't, I just don't want to deal with it. I just want to get it over with. And he had to do it on my own terms. Yeah, and he, he said, you know, I've, I've, got a, I've got a job to do right now, which is to die. It's my last job. I want to do it well and easily. And it, but he, he sort of thought about his family, too. And he thought, you know, I, owe, I sort of owe it to them to try and escape once. And, a, and, and so he tried to get out of the wheelhouse, and he thought, if I... If I run into a wall or say, if I can't get out of here, I'll try once. If I can't get out, then I'll let myself exhale. And by some chance, um, he slipped out through a, a broken window or something. He's not sure what he went out of, but um, and then he popped up, and you know, and he's all alone. The rest of the crew had died in the boat, and he popped up, and he's all alone on the Atlantic, 200 miles from shore. I mean, it's, it's outrageous. And the lifeboat popped up too. The life oh. raft inflated, it, it inflated automatically, and it popped up, and it was still tethered, tethered to the boat. And he climbed in, and as the boat sank, he cut the rope and um, drifted for three days in late November in the North Atlantic. And he finally, he was, kept getting tossed out of the life raft, and he was in his underwear. I and mean, he had nothing on. And, and, um, Exposure. Crazy. Yeah. And I'm he, exhausted thinking about yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Hotel, but... He was finally picked up. I don't have that shivering. <laughs> well, he, he was finally picked up by the Coast Guard, and they rushed him to the hospital. He had hyper, terrible hypothermia. And... Um, I asked him, I had the feeling no one had asked him this question. I flew out to California to talk to him when I was researching the book. And I said, I said, God, you must have been terribly cold. I mean, wh how long did it take to warm up? And I imagined him there at a hospital bed. He's drinking hot chocolate and the IV drip, whatever. And, and I imagined it would take an hour to, you know, whatever. How long does it take to warm up? And he really thought about it. He sort of scratched his chin and said, um, oh, it took about two or three months to warm up. Jesus. Yeah. And he wasn't, you know, yeah. he's totally like, you know, sort of literal guy, you know. So, yeah. It was about two or three months before I was finally warm. Let me quickly turn to this part of the story before we go to Diane. It is that, that so you write this book, which you just did, using all the techniques you could find to bring people what it must have been for 
six men on the Andrea Gale. You go to Hollywood to sell it before it's published, correct? That's right. You and your agent. Mm -hmm. How much interest is there? Uh, the first day, absolutely none. Right. The second day, a little bit. But the third day, I had the feeling that word was getting around. <laughs> that there's this book that may yeah. be interesting. Yeah, and, and it's funny, in Hollywood, I have the feeling that they get worried just if other people are yeah, having exactly. meetings that they're Bidding not having. Bidding war. Yes. Bidding war right. goes yeah. from zero to 60. And, right. and it, was, it was all about the... Po that's what it seemed like. It was a little bit about the politics of the place. Like, oh, they're having meetings and I'm not. And yeah. 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 And How can they know that and I don't? Maybe yeah. there's something here. Right, exactly. And they, there's sort of, sort of this weird paranoia. And yeah. by, fr by Friday, there was a, an, an auction. And, and you liked one group of guys who came to you, I guess, from Spring or from Spring, some, Spring, Spring Creek, Creek yeah. and, then, and they were part of Warner Brothers. By all. Right. So Warner, and then it's sort of lying there. Nothing is happening. And right. you're thinking, they can never make a movie out of my book. Right. And then all of a sudden, the book hits number one on the bestseller list. Yeah. Right? That's right. When was that? Summer of? 97. 97. And they say, we're making a movie. They sort of woke up to yeah, it. Right. I, think we got, I, I had the image of someone, someone saying, my God, we own this thing. Yeah, right. of <laughs> no, your image is, you talk about this in a piece, you're saying the guy's sitting by the pool, you right. know, and, and all inside. of a sudden he reads, oh, I, own I, own <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I own this. I own this. Hello, 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 hello. Exactly. You know, exactly. why aren't we making this movie? I knew it was going to be number one. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. And that's what happened. That's what happened. Yeah. And then, and then there was a search for the right director. Uh, first, the right writer. I think they, writer. I think they went yeah. to the writer, Bill Whitliff. Right. Uh, and then, oh, I mean, it was right around the same time, right. I guess. And, and then Wolfgang Peterson. Is Peterson just the perfect guy to do this because of what we knew about Das Boot? Well, I, th I mean, that's one of the best movies I know, and one of the very best movies that takes place on the sea. And now, why is it so good? Das Boot? Yeah. He. Not that I'm questioning, I'm just yeah. asking for your explanation. Well, I mean, it's, he, he it's really just the story of these men contained in this boat. Yeah, I mean, he developed a feeling of, of claustrophobia right. that is just excruciating. And he also kept it apolitical. And you forget, you, you forget that these, you know, you, there's so many American movies where the Germans are the bad guys. And, you know, it's such an easy story to tell, you know. It's, and basically what you, reali you realize one of the sort of major truths about war, which is that most of it is fought by young guys who are just unlucky to be there. You know, they're not the, the evil or they're right, not whatever. Right, they're right. just poor guys story stuck in a submarine. Story. And it could be an American sub, American right. guys, but it happens to be Germ a German sub. And you're like, God, these guys are 22. They don't want to die. And that's, that's the... The humanity. The yeah, that's the major thing about war that everyone mm -hmm. forgets, is that for most of the people fighting it, it's not a political act. I'm going to come back to you in terms of the movie and the differences in what you see in the movie. It's not in the book or what's in the book. It's not in the movie, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When, had you read this when they called you, when your agent or somebody calls up and says... I'd heard of it. I'd heard a lot about it. It yeah. had been highly recommended to me, and... As the single mother of a young daughter, I didn't have the leisure of uh, right, entertainment right, reading. Right, right. But uh, as soon as I, I heard about it in terms of being a film and a role and the possibility for myself, I read it in one night. Did you? read it in one yeah. night. I couldn't put it down. It was that good. And had they offered you the role by then? It is or? that good. Um, I don't recall the sequence of events, but I do know that I met with Wolfgang and... I, I, lo and behold, without having to screen test and the indignity of that. That was my that, question. You took me on. How awkward Thank you. that is. Yeah. Um, I, I got the offer. So he said, we want you. <laughs> because yeah. I don't test well, and had I, I might not have gotten it, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. But, um, yeah, so yeah. the book is, uh, is, is the, it's a great book. This is Did you know it's a great book? <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about making the movie for you. I mean, you have talked about the fact that, that you felt sitting on that dock. Mm that when you were crying because your man, because he wanted to get some fish and make some money, had been taken by the sea from you, mm -hmm. that you were crying for every woman. And the children. And who every lost child dads, who'd ever lost someone. And the dads who lost sea. the experience of fathering their children. And yeah, there, well, it's very available in the air in Gloucester. It's something about the place that it's almost tangible, the history of all the hundreds of years of the, the boards are literally worn down by women pacing, anxiously looking at the horizon for their mast, for their man's ship. Mm. And I felt that it was, I felt it was a call that wanted to be responded to. And here was a moment to give something to answer that call emotionally respond back to the guys that have gone 
And it sounds extremely corny, but when you get to that emotional place and you're trying to deliver the goods for the people who are going, who live this, they're sitting in the audience. I mean, I, you know, I met the, these family members, the people that were interviewed by Sebastian that formed the book, and this thing has become huge now for them, but they started out by being willing to talk to Sebastian, and now, of course, it's become larger than life, literally, but, you know, to... to to talk with Christina Cotter and who's the character you play? To, who's, who's the character I portray? The woman I portray, the real person I portray, which is a funny yeah. <laughs> phrase. But um, I was trying to do justice to that uns unspoken emotional place that is rather obvious, but yet um, it's it's timeless. You know that kind of sure. suffering. You didn't go to her immediately, though. You no, waited. I held back. I was a bit afraid to... I was concerned that maybe there were aspects, because I know as an actress this <laughs> happens quite a bit. Um, I'm sure she gave days of interviews to you. Having spoken with her, she said it was a couple of days, five days yeah. of her time. And out of that, choices were made of what would... You know, you trim and you, and you make decisions to make the book as good as it can be, and I'm thinking, okay, what did she tell Sebastian that she wishes were going to be in the film that he didn't include in the book, so she's going to turn to me with the truth. He's going to give you something. Right, and I'm supposed to approach Wolfgang <laughs> yeah. and say, now, listen, you got to fix your script, because, because I got the truth Because now. Diane's super journalist that she is, <laughs> all those things that average journalist Sebastian couldn't get, I got. Yeah, that was my And I, lucky director, closet egomaniac. Am, go am going to help you understand my character. Right, right. Is well, that the conversation? Uh, sort of. That was, a, that was a little fear that I had, that um, I would be torn by wanting to be uh, respectful and pleasing to Christina Cotter, the real woman, because it's such a sacred place you're going to, and you have to have that accountability there, that she was going to have some aspects that I couldn't incorporate, and I would be frustrated by that, and it would pollute my mind when I really had to you know, offer up what was required by the screenplay, and that's my job. So there's many stages removed from the men who aren't there to tell what occurred on the boat and their side of the story. You know, we're, 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 the surviving loved ones are telling the story. And the book, the screenplay, the editing, the promotion, you know, there's many stages removed. So I was trying to hearken back as much as I could to Christina. And uh, that's what held me back from meeting her until I felt safe that I had established the character. Um, Roll tape. This is the first scene we'll see of you, and then followed by another one. Go back to what you did before. Pack hard, repair tackle. I'm sick of that. It's safe and it pays. Not enough. Just one more time, I promise. Hmm. One of the things that they say, critics, about this film, beyond how extraordinary real the sense of the storm is, mm -hmm is how smart it was and how productive it is that Wolfgang created the relationships and the context mm -hmm. in the beginning of this film. Agreed? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, I did the same thing with the book, right, probably exactly. for the same reason. You know, yeah. you, uh, you have to do that to get people to care about six men on a boat they don't know. It's sort of like forensics. You work your way backwards and then yeah. Yeah. satisfy what you would want to know. I mean, suppose yeah. that the ice machine hadn't been broken, could they have just stayed out there until the storm passed? No, because the, the weather goes from west to east. They were going to get hit at some point or another. The only thing they could have done... So they were dead in the water from the get-go. Yeah, the only thing they could have done was... Try to go south? No, north. 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 No. Up, up into the cold water of the Labrador Current. And cold yeah. water doesn't... Um, the waves don't get as big. The Gulf Stream is really quite, quite dangerous with the storm. And... Um, you get the Gulf Stream flowing to the east towards Europe and the wind coming, going towards the west and the, the clash of those two makes huge seas. And right at the end, he veered north, I think, uh, to get out, of, they got out of those dangerous waters, but it was too late. Uh, that, if he made an error, it was not staying north. Just for the record, what was the last contact with the boat? It was a 6 p.m. Uh, radio, radio call to the fleet in general. Um, he was describing 
the, the fleet was to the to the east of him, and the weather goes west to east. So the boats that are, you know, uh, that hit the weather first, they radio back to the rest of the fleet what the weather's doing because the you know they're basically radioing in what's going to happen to the fleet in 12 hours or whatever, 24 hours. So he was as as he hit the storm, he was checking in, saying, "Hey guys, it's pretty bad, etc." We, you know, we just entered it, and um, the last radio communication that I could determine was, um, he said, uh, talking about the storm, he said, she, she's coming on, boys, she's coming on strong. Saying that to other fishermen? Yeah. Coming on strong. Around. Yeah. around. Are the fishermen around? Well, they were further east. Mm -hmm. And so basically what Billy Tai was experiencing heat, they were going to get in 12 hours or so. And wh what, was the last, what was the last contact between Linda and Billy? That, that was it. That was the last thing she heard. She heard. She yeah. heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Roll tape. This is you in a, in a scene in which you are clearly distraught that this boat with your loved one is missing. Here it is. I hate the game. I hate the damn game. Do you hear me? Do you read me? Do you? Do you read me? No, no, no. Well done. Thank you. Casting is almost perfect, isn't it? I have to yeah. say that yeah. that scene is interesting because when I read the script, I saw that they were cutting from the storm, cutting to this, and cutting back to the storm. <laughs> and I realized you can't be too big. <laughs> just go, <laughs> go a little more can't. for it. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I still feel don't like don't worry I, about going go over the to top 11. in this one. Yeah. You can't get that high. No. Uh, casting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was great. It, it was. It, it made some very good choices. What's the response in Gloucester? I haven't physically been there since the movie. But you talk on telephone. Like yeah, well, just yesterday I did. Um, I talked with Marianne Shepard, who's the sister. Right. And I asked her what what's the word on the street in Gloucester because I haven't had a chance great. to go up there. And um, and he's uh, she said that people um, people really love it. That, that she's just stopped on the street continually by people saying, "Wow, they really." They did Hon as well. Yeah, they honored the town, they honored the industry. Um, it was great. So. I had someone say to me that they had the feeling comparatively, and it's a comparative business, I hate to do comparisons, but that sort of the fish, the fishermen were feeling the way wor World War II vets felt watching Private Ryan. Oh, really? That they yeah. felt, that oh my God, they finally captured yeah. the wall that we hit sometimes. Yeah. and. The, the hairy times that we go through as a community. The oh. best. I mean, all of the, all of the life of both the hunt for the fish and how you win or lose, depending on whether you catch the fish, the risk that that's there, the camaraderie, you know. And also, you know, the people have been writing and talking about the notion of where things that would happen in the film wouldn't happen in real life. Two, two guys wouldn't dive off the boat like that, mm -hmm. which doesn't bother me because the notion is that the point is here that in moments of danger people who are ready to kill each other on board mm -hmm. come to the aid of each other and the dramatic device right. was this. Right. That's right. I, I would agree. I mean, there were things that departed from the book in, in, in specifics and details, but there was... It was amalgamated. Yeah, right. That's that word again. <laughs> well, well, um, um, well, were they, but they never violated any, any sort of base, anything basic about the book that I, that, you know, that I you know, believed in. It was, um, of course, some of the details were changed, but they never, it was no, never a betrayal, yeah. a betrayal of the truth. They kept the faith. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, <laughs> you were worried that they were going to say <laughs> that, that one survived. Yeah. You know, the idea is that Clooney survived or something. Right. You can't kill, you can't kill yeah, George yeah, Clooney. Yeah, for exactly. God's sake, what kind of movie is this? Yeah, right. I, you know, right. I was and they said right away, no. Yeah, I mean, I went in when I had my first meeting with Wolfgang, who I liked immediately. Um, yeah. He, um, I said, look, if you if you have anyone survive on the boat, you have to change all the names, because I have to go back to Gloucester. Mm -hmm. I know these people. I don't I don't want to tell Ethel Shadford, look, you know, in real life your son died, but in the movie version he comes back. I, you know, don't make me do that. Yeah. And um, and they were completely cool with that. Oh, great. There were some things about the the book in re in reviewing it again, to see the changes that once once you read the screenplay, you stick with that. But I wanted to go back uh, because I knew we were going to be doing this today and look at it and talking with Christina in Gloucester face to face after the movie was done. Um, you know, she was bawling her eyes out at the dock saying goodbye to Bobby. Yeah. And they all had a 
horrible sinking feeling, the, the feeling, the one that you don't want to have before you go to sea. When it's a very premonitory kind of industry, yeah. and for the film, we didn't go to that place because we had so far to go emotionally that we lightened that aspect of it. You didn't have her crying as he's leaving. Well, then I would be doing nothing but crying throughout the whole <laughs> film. There had, right. in but point there of was truth, this notion. You, know? you didn't. You, you still had. Uh, the notion we have a bad feeling. I have a bad. Yes, feeling. yes. We 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 tried to in include that, uh, but not to the degree that that she had in in, in at the real time because uh, it tells you too much about what you can expect. This is a silly question, but I'll ask it anyway. Compare. I mean, how do you uh, compare to everything else you've done? Is this at the top? <laughs> Somebody recently made a joke about The Perfect Storm replacing every other entry on my resume. I am now the girl from The Perfect Storm, and that's okay with me. I mean, isn't that what she sort of aimed for? She's an actor. She made The Perfect Storm. That's right. all you need yeah. to know. Well, but what, I mean, on a serious way, people are saying, what film will catapult you into the first rank in terms of, of whatever bank of building and all that stuff Putting mean? out a zero on the end of my paycheck? Um, that's okay with you like if it does man. that, right? Oh, don't go there. No, it's, it's all... Pay me like a man, don't go there. It's all good. It's all good. I, it's nice to be in a film that people see. Yeah. Pay, it's also nice because you know? people have believed in you, people like Francis Ford Coppola and other people have believed yes. in you for a while. And to They've see invested you, in me. And invested in you. i got to start paying back, right? <laughs> well, you've got to show that their instincts were good. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> not that you haven't before, Thank but this you. is in terms of, of an enhanced... This is show business. This is big yeah. time. Not show love and show friends. <laughs> show, but this is a big opportunity, yeah, which big has time. proven to be... Yes, Pretty very good. rewarding for everyone. Yeah. I'm just... I mean, they, this could tickle be... Tickle pink for all of us. This could be a $200 million movie, couldn't it? Yeah, I guess it could. I guess. I don't oh, know anything he about said them. it. I don't. Charlie said <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it. You named the figure. We're doing. <laughs> it's great to meet you, and thank you for coming. Thank you so Sebastian, much. Sebastian, it's great to have you back. Um, thank you. And congratulations on the book and the movie Wolfgang. I hope we'll be here to talk about the making of it as well. Yeah, um, Wolfgang. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. <laughs>